Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. Throughout history, the world's finest scientific minds have struggled to develop effective vaccines to cure plagues and pandemics. But not this time. Without wishing to detract from the terrible suffering and death toll of COVID-19, the virus has highlighted the spectacular advances in scientific discovery. It took four days to sequence a genomic code and design a vaccine for COVID-19. Yes, just four days. So what are the implications of this for finding cures to other diseases? I'm joined by Julia Angelis, who's co-manager of Bailey Gifford's Health Innovation Fund. But before we start the conversation, some important information. Please remember that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. And this podcast has been recorded during COVID-19. So Julia and I are both at home as opposed to in the usual Edinburgh studio. Julia, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Malcolm. It's a pleasure to be at home. <laughs> and let's let's start with that four days, because that's an extraordinarily short period of time. Not long to find a solution and design a vaccine. Talk me through that. Actually, it took us just two days to read the blueprint of the COVID-19 um, virus and two days to produce a vaccine that actually now in humans. And the reason why it became possible is because we had all these technologies already being proven and working in real life. So to read uh, the genome of virus, we use a technology called genome sequencing. This is technology produced by company like Illumina. And we already been experimenting with this, with this tool for more than a decade and continuously reducing cost and increasing the precision of the technology. And because of these advancements that have been really gr- uh, groundbreaking, we could really read and uh, analyze the genome of the virus in such a short time. Some of the leading vaccine technologies, which are already on the market and saving many lives, are based on an entirely new approaches, which relying on technologies like messenger RNA. What messenger RNA does, it codes for the certain proteins within the virus that in turn have been expressed in our bodies for the immune system to recognize and produce antibodies against it. So as you hear, so a lot of it is actually uh, looks more like digital technologies rather than anything we know from life science, life science industries from the past. So this has genuinely been a transformative uh, shift in the way we think about a vaccine. And this also why it allows us to come up with a solution in such a short period of time. And what are the implications of messenger RNA for other diseases? The applications are very broad, but if we take the closest to now what most people understand how messenger RNA works in the vaccine space, the next big kill applications is actually apply the same concept, but to oncology. So companies like uh, Moderna, BioNTech, and QVAC, these three companies are leading the space within messenger RNA, and all of them working are working on vaccines for cancer, personal vaccines. When patients are diagnosed with cancer, we can understand actually what sort of profile this cancer has. And cancer have their own signatures, genomic uh, signatures, based on the mutations that took place in, in, in cancerous cells. And then we can take this information and translate in the biomarkers to trigger immune system to recognize the cancer cell and kill it. So we again, we play, we, uh, we leverage on the role of the immune system to kill the cancerous cells. And we also use a personalized approach where every patient is treated with individual, with individual uh, approach where every cancer got sequenced, analyzed, and then we program messenger RNA to reflect the signatures of the patient cancer. So this is, this is a genuine paradigm shift in the way we approach. This is a generally personalized approach. So this is kind of the closest to the vaccine space. But another, another application could be is if, for example, in rare diseases, very often we are missing certain proteins that perform important functions. And what messenger RNA can do is program for that missing protein, and then it can be delivered in the right place in the body, and the body starts producing those proteins. So suddenly, it's, it's, kind of, it's a very natural approach. This is the way biology works. And uh, what these companies have done, they have hijacked the biological process, and it's as close as you can get to it. So as I say, in a way, there, is, there are no limitations how messenger RNA can be used. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's interesting because uh, messenger RNA has been around for a while, hasn't it? It is. And actually, the first company who moved into the spaces, it was a German company called QVAC. But they've been much slower than Moderna of bringing drugs to the market. And um, so, as I say, the idea actually is not new, uh, but it's just executing on that idea is really, really difficult because as soon as you... uh, as soon as you inject messenger RNA in human body, immune system would recognize it and destroy it. So that way I keep referring to the delivery mechanism. It's just been fundamentally you know, crucial to solve that challenge in order to make messenger RNA into the drug. That's an interesting point you raise about execution and the ability of companies to execute on, on these ideas. How important is that to when you're looking at the possibility of investing in companies, their ability to execute? Now, this is one of the very important aspects uh, for every investment um, we make, because you can have an amazing technology, but if you don't have a management team that has a long-term vision and are be, uh, also able to attract capital and talent, it's almost irrelevant what technology you have in your hand. And now, given the pace of technological innovation, it, you you will be very quickly displaced if you don't move fast and you manage to attract capital and talent. And for example, with Moderna, what we saw at the early stage is that they managed to do both uh, capital and on people side extremely well. They have some of the best talents on both um, science side, but also they managed to attract the best talent on the on the manufacturing side, which is also extremely important for, uh, for scalability of this technology. So, and also another important aspect, of course, is capital. And Moderna managed to raise billions of dollars prior they went public, which is also important to, to in the process of companies' evolution, because as companies stay private, they, they're in much better place to experiment, do mistakes, and really having no pressures from external investors. So we, we really think you know, the more companies manage to raise at the early stage, the better it's for them for the long term. As you've mentioned, Moderna is a great example of where healthcare and tech intersect. And and also, I guess, our ability to use and make sense of data, which is vital. Give me some other examples of companies where you see that interaction between healthcare, data and tech. Yes, of course. One of my favorite examples is portable ultrasound uh, machine. So as most people would know, currently ultrasound is performed in the hospitals in the dark room with a massive machine and and it will be operated by a person who has many years of education because the technology is really sophisticated. It takes really a skill to acquire the image and also a skill to make interpretation. And for and, and it's also quite expensive um, diagnostic tool. And for these reasons, currently two thirds of the world don't have access to ultra ultrasound technology. And this is really quite a sad statistics because we, I mean, this this tool is incredibly powerful of diagnosing many many diseases. And this very much still remains the case that you know most of the world don't have access to it. Butterfly Network has come up with a portable device that solves all the challenges that actually stop that technology to be uh, accessible all around the world. So one is cost, another one is usability. So the cost of their device, which is uh, the size of the of the palm, is two thousand dollars, which is hundreds times cheaper, which are uh, compared to traditional machine. So this is already transformational. But what is even more exciting, they managed to uh, integrate machine learning tools in both acquisition of the image and interpretation. So the reason why Butterfly was able to achieve such a device is because they reinvented the underlying technology of ultrasound. They put it on a chip. So the same technology that powers our phones and our computers. And as we know, if you put something on the chip and when you start scaling up, the costs just decrease um, 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 exponentially. 
So this is one aspect why it's allowed to make them such a cheap uh, tool. But then in addition to that, all data are stored in cloud, processed in cloud, and then you use machine learning to make interpretation. So as you can hear, you're using all these technologies that we're using also in other industries. And when you bring it to healthcare and you combine them in a very intelligent way, it's just you come up with entirely new ways of doing things, entirely new ways of practicing health. And we're already seeing that this tool is transforming the patient care in both developed countries, but even more importantly, in developing countries that will be leapfrogging from those big machines directly to something that's actually much more powerful that we know in the developed world. And how did you get interested in health as an investor? Have you always been interested uh, in fact, I was always interested even before becoming an investor. I studied economics um, and before choosing to go for economics, I was actually considering to go and study medicine. But for some reason in my 20s, I decided that economic is probably more useful science and I can do a lot of good things with that. And then you study economics and you realize there is a lot of theories and very little application to the, to the real life. And uh, but still, it, of course, it teaches a lot of interesting methodologies and mental models. Um, and healthcare for me has always been a fascinating area because I always try to understand actually how human body works, and then you uh, start learning actually how little we understood, and then it became like a challenge. And and when you see what's happening now is proliferation of all these tools that really help us to understand actually how we function as uh, very complex human entities then that's just, uh, it's probably the most exciting time to look in that space. So in a way, maybe I was lucky not to do it as a traditional way of medicine uh, when I started at actually looking at healthcare at this stage. Because there's so much more to learn, especially about areas like the brain, where our understanding at the moment is, is probably fairly limited. Indeed. And the brain areas really have been the last frontier that's been so difficult to address for scientists and for the companies to come up with um, effective drugs against diseases like Alzheimer's. And this is for the very good reason, because we, it, to get access to the brain and study it has been really impossible. We can only study brain when actually just in, in dead people. But what's really fascinating, over last decade, we had proliferation of new technologies and new tools that gave us insight into the brain. So one, one technology linked to that is imaging. So we have a variety of imaging approaches, how we can actually analyze brain. But another one which is really fascinating is stem cells. We can actually use patients' stem cells, patients who have Alzheimer's, for example, to trigger their cells to be neurons, diseased neurons. And then we can study those neurons in a Petri dish. And we can even experiment what sort of drugs could possibly work you know, to invigorate neuron. And this has been really transformational in the way we can study the brain disease, but also potentially finding treatments for, for brain diseases. And then, of course, there has been another massive challenge. Is one is to understand actually what's driving diseases, but another one is actually getting access to brain. And as we know, there is a blood-brain barrier for the good reason, to protect from brain from invaders. And it, but it also, actually also protects brain from good things, something maybe we would like to supply brain with. And, uh, and that challenge has been there for decades. And only recently, we start making some big uh, uh, steps towards uh, finding solutions, how we can um, uh, bypass that challenge. And companies like Denali is really making a lot of progress in addressing the blood-brain barrier. And actually, they already demonstrated uh, through their technologies that they could get through, the, through that challenge. So this is really exciting. So on one side, we, we start understanding better what drives brain diseases. But on the other hand, we also have tools to get access to brain. So this will be transformational for the, for, the, um, for, for, for the brain biology in the long term. That's a great place to end it, Julia. Thank you so much. It's very exciting, the developments that we're seeing in health innovation at the moment. It's exciting indeed. And we really uh, uh, think our job is so fascinating and we're continuously looking for these uh, transformational companies. And thank you for listening to me. You can find our podcast short briefings on long-term thinking at baileygifford.com forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or TuneIn. 
And if you enjoyed it, please spread the word. And in our next podcast, we'll be looking at ESG. How does Bailey Gifford view ESG? Is it just an extension of our long-term thinking? And how should we engage with companies to find solutions to society's challenges and drive progress? That's in the next edition. And many thanks to Lord of the Isles for the music. The track we've used is called Horizon Effect, which was released on Permanent Vacation. And if you're listening at home, you're listening in the car, wherever you're listening, stay well. And we look forward to bringing you more insights in our next podcast. Thank you.